So, so I have a couple of announcements to make before we uh, get down to doing fun stuff. There are few changes to the schedule. So uh, Leon Boutou is not going to speak today. He had to leave because of a family emergency. I will do one more hour of lectures, more than as planned, so I'll impose upon you for another hour. Uh, and uh, Dr. David Lewis' talk has been moved from 2 to 3. It has been moved to 1 to 2. And then from two to th uh, between 2 to 3, we will have a panel discussion on what are the hot and emerging areas in machine learning and how can you choose your dissertation topic. Okay, so there are a bunch of very interesting people on the panel. Um, hopefully, we'll have a good discussion. So if you have any questions, um, think about them while you're uh, in, the, in the morning and, and come to the panel. Okay. So before we begin, any questions about things that we covered last time? It's been a while, I know. So any, any questions, comments? Anybody have opinions? OK, good. So today, what we are going to do is I'm going to go a little bit out of sequence. So instead of finishing off the, optim uh, the lecture two on optimization, we're actually going to go directly to lecture three and four, which sort of make logical sense, and they're connected together. And then I'll come back to lecture two and, uh, and finish up with lecture five. So two, the, the last part of lecture two and lecture five are more logically connected. Okay, so I don't want to have too many jumps. So what we're going to talk about in the first lecture today is uh, all about a certain class of methods which are called bundle methods. Okay, and uh, I'll show you a little bit about why you, you want to care about them and a little bit about what you can do when you know that you're dealing with machine learning problems. Okay, so that's what is our agenda today. We'll go really, really slow and easy. Okay, so some of you may already know many of the things that are being covered. Uh, but please bear with me because we have a very varied audience. And the other thing to keep in mind is many equations were harmed in writing today's slides. Okay? So there are some parts which are equation heavy. So I just want to warn you. But again, with that disclaimer, I want to add something, which is that at least when I am trying to present to you these equations, I'm trying to convey the intuition to you. Right? So don't worry as much about the exact math and, and not, don't try to you know, parse every epsilon delta on this slide, but sort of try more to, to get the intuition for what is happening. You know, the slides are always available online, so you can go back, look at them. I'll give you references for papers to look at, so you can, you can do all of that later, right? So, but don't sort of look at this uh, equation heavy slide and get into this, oh my God, so many symbols and let me parse them, okay? So keep that in mind. And I'll try to walk you through those equations in a gentle manner and try to give you intuition. After all, that's the whole point of coming to a talk. Otherwise, you'd have just read the paper and you know, be happy. OK, so with that disclaimer out of the way, let's get started. And I want to show you, uh, remind you again that what we are interested many times in machine learning is that you're trying to do some sort of regularized risk minimization. Okay, so the way uh, you can set this objective function up, and we looked at uh, some ways of setting this up before, is that you're given some amount of training data and you're given some labels. Again, this is a fairly restrictive setting. We are aiming or shooting for simplicity rather than generality here. Okay? And uh, so we are just considering the case where you have labels. So you have data and you have some, some training labels associated with the data. And our goal is to learn a vector, which is, the, which is the parameter of our model. And the way we are going to learn this vector is by setting up a regularized risk minimization problem. So there is a regularizer, which penalizes complex models. And then there is the empirical risk, which is just obtained by averaging the loss of your model on your data points. Okay? And then there is lambda, which is a trade-off parameter, and you minimize this. Okay? So this is a fairly general principle, underlies many, many different machine learning algorithms. 
In fact, um, if you look at one of the references that I'll give you in the end, there are about 20 or 25 different algorithms that you can derive just based on this simple principle. Okay? So what we are going to do today is uh, concentrate on a very simple problem, which is that of binary classification using a linear support vector machine. Okay? So that is going to be our running example, not only for this lecture, but for pretty much the, the, all the lectures except the last one where we'll talk a little bit about kernels, okay? So the task here is, is really, really simple. So you're given some set of points. These points say there are some red diamonds and then there are some blue dots, okay? And clearly, you can see, I mean, this is a two-dimensional toy problem and clearly you can see that these points are linearly separable, okay? So there's no problem with that. What I want to show you is that there is a very geometric way of coming up with, an, with a model, and actually if you r jump through the right hoops, then basically the model reduces back to a regularized risk minimization problem. Okay, so sort of, they both are equivalent, and this, is, this happens all the time in machine learning, that you, some people believe religiously in a certain principle, and they go off and they keep on instantiating that principle, and they get different models. Other people believe in other religions. They keep on going and instantiating their principles, and they get models. And it turns out that they all are very closely related. Okay, so that's sort of I want to give you a flavor for that today. Okay, so here, as you can see, geometrically, there are it's it's rather easy to imagine that there are a number of linear lines or a number of hyperplanes which can separate your blue dots from your circles from your diamonds. Yeah, so it's uh, the, the, the number of them. Here is just one example of a plane. Okay. How good is this plane? You want to ask this question, okay, if, if, I, if, I want to, if I want to come up with some measure of goodness of how good this plane is, one way to think about this measure of goodness is to say, you look at the closest point from the red cloud, and you look at the closest point from the blue cloud, uh, from the blue cloud, and then you look for how fat this separation is. So in other words, how far away is this black line from this, from this blue dotted line and from this red dotted line, right? So this is a fairly good question to ask because you're saying in some sense from among all different linear hyperplanes which can separate this data, you want one which is maximally non-committal, right? So it's, uh, you know, you don't want commitments. You, you, know, you run away from commitments, so you, you, you try very hard. <laughs> Especially, <laughs> some of you would understand that. <laughs> so, so um, and you try to find out what, what, how can I maximize this separation between the blue class uh, and the, the red class, okay? So clear? So, since you're working with linear hyperplanes, you can always write the equation of this linear hyperplane as follows. Right? So you, this, is, this is fairly straightforward uh, algebra uh, you know, geometry that you learned from high school, perhaps. So the, the equation of this linear hyperplane can be written as Wx plus b. b is the offset, and you have w, which is the normal vector to this hyperplane. Okay? Now, if you ponder about it for just about a minute, you'll immediately find something that is strange. The strange thing here is that if I scale W and B both by a, a positive scalar alpha, it turns out that I recover exactly the same equation again, exactly the same plane again. So what is happening here is that there is a small identifiability issue. Right? The identifiability issue is that scaling your parameters recovers you exactly the same hyperplane. Okay? So there are different ways in which you can fix the scaling, and let me give you a fairly geometric way of fixing the scaling for now, okay? So the fairly geometric way of fixing the scaling is to say, I'm going to arbitrarily assume that the closest point from the red cloud to this black hyperplane has the, satisfies the, uh, lies on the plane, Wx plus b equals one. Again, I want to remind you that one is not a sacrosanct number. You could have used 42, okay? You could have used any number. As long as that number is a constant, that's all that matters, okay? Now you see, once you do this, and you assume the same thing for the blue cloud, immediately the scaling issue is fixed. 
right? Because if I now scale anything by alpha, I get alpha w and alpha b, that becomes alpha instead of 1, right? So the scaling issue immediately gets fixed, got it? So now, once you have this kind of, once you have this kind of a setup, you still have to go back and ask the question, how good is this plane? How good, uh, how, what is the measure of goodness of this plane, right? I mean, how can I find out how fat this thing is? So again, think about it geometrically first before we look at the equations. Geometrically, what do you want? You want a, a, a vector which connects x1 to x2 and you want to project it onto the normal vector to the plane, right? And that should give you basically the, the length of this black line, okay? And that is the measure of goodness of the plane. Now let us see geometrically, so we have this in mind that uh, this is what we want to do. We want to project this vector into the unit, the unit vector which is normal to the plane and try to get this black line, the length of this black line. So how do we do this? We know that we have fixed the scaling of the plane in the following way. So you just subtract these two equations, you get this. And since you want to project x1 minus x2 in the direction of the unit normal to the plane, right? So you want a unit normal vector to the plane. How do you get a unit normal? You just divide it by the norm of w. So you take w and you divide it by the norm of w. Once you divide w by the norm of w and multiply it with x1 minus x2, you get this equation which is that the, the, this, this how fat this uh, margin is, is nothing but 2 over norm of w, okay? So now you can go off and set up an optimization problem, okay? So this is sort of the geometry and now let's set up the optimization problem. So what does the optimization problem say? I want to maximize the margin, okay? Such that all my points lie on the right side of the boundary, right? So of course, you know, you remember you want that all the red points should lie on this side, all the blue points should lie on this side, okay? So that's a requirement and that's what, that's exactly what is being expressed here in terms of the constraints, clear? Now, you usually don't want to deal with maximization problems just because we are talking about convex functions. If you were doing maximization, you'd have to deal with a concave function, which is more or less symmetric. But for whatever historical reasons, people always prefer convex functions, so we'll also go with convex functions. I've done one more thing along with it, right? So I've squared the norm. This is very important. Okay? This, this uh, is what makes things really work nice. If you didn't square them, things wouldn't work as, as nicely as they work here, okay? So now you say, okay, let us minimize this uh, square norm of uh, W subject to the constraint that all the points have to lie on the right side of the hyperplane, yeah. clear? Uh, of course, then there is, a, there is a small problem, there's a pesky fly in the ointment that you need to deal with because that the data may not be linearly separable. You know, I just showed you a really nice data set and some of you may be thinking, huh, okay, yeah, you cooked up a two-dimensional example and everything was fine, but what if the data is not linearly separable, okay? So one way to handle this is to say, well, you know, let us be a little bit loose. You know, let's not try to be too ambitious and instead of asking for every data point to be correctly classified, let me say I'm willing to tolerate a little bit of slack, okay? So I'm, I'm saying, you know, even if, if a couple of, if a few points went here and there, I'm fine, I don't want to worry about them, okay? So that is what you express by adding the psi i. The psi i is a, is a, is a non-negative variable and it is in fact called a slack variable, okay? So the slack variable ensures that even if you had your, even if some of the points did not get classified correctly, they would be fine. But there is a small problem with this equation still, with this optimization still, right? The small problem with this optimization is that I do not have any control over the psi i's. Okay, all I'm telling you is that psi i's must be non-negative. So whatever w that you give me, however bad it is, I can always let the psi i's go to infinity and satisfy this constraint. So in other words, almost everything, including the most useless things, are a solution. Okay, so how do you, how do you get around this problem? And this is a recurrent theme you'll see again and again, uh, you know, at least two times in this lecture, and many, many, many times in your career in machine learning is that when you have something like, like a situation like this where 
you have variables, and if the variables were not constrained in the right way somehow, or were not penalized in the right way somehow, the equation, the solutions you'd get are garbage. And the usual way in which you fix it is just by going and saying, okay, let me penalize these variables. Right? So in other words, yes, you can go and have a data point which is not correctly classified, but in return, you have to pay me a price. Okay? So in some sense, you're encouraging your problem, your solution, to correctly classify as many points as it can, because then for those points, the psi i's will be equal to zero, and you'll incur no penalty in the objective function. Okay? But there will be some points which are you know, hopeless, and you just want to say, okay, for those points, I'm willing to pay a price and misclassify them. Clear? So now, let us try to, so this is a, sort of the, the classical equation of a linear support vector machine, and this is completely geometric, right? So we came from uh, a completely geometric viewpoint and came up with this objective function, okay? Now let us massage this objective function a little bit, and I want to show you that if you massage it in the right way, you will get a objective function which does regularized risk minimization, right? So sort of, it seems like the two are completely disconnected, but now I want to show you that they're not. So before we go on, questions? Some of it is fairly elementary. I'm sure many of you have seen this presented uh, in, in some way or the other. Okay? So now let's do some massaging. Okay? So the first thing I'm going to do is to move psi i to this side. This is, a, this is a valid transformation. Nothing has changed. Now you can see that psi i has these two constraints, which is that psi i must be bigger than 1 minus y i w dot x i plus b, and psi i must be bigger than 0. And now is this trick that is a, a fairly common trick in optimization that you can take whatever is in the constraints and put it into the objective function if you, if you do it in the right way, okay? The right way here turns out to be that you just replace psi i with those two constraints that you had. So you want that the psi i must be bigger than zero, okay, clear? And you also want psi i must be bigger than one minus y i w dot x i plus b. Once you do that, psi i is, uh, the, the constraints are eliminated, and you also eliminated psi i from your objective function, right? So this is sort of, this is a standard trick in optimization. If you have not seen this before, it seems like magic. If you have seen this before, sort of you know what I'm talking about, okay? But now having done the standard trick, you can immediately see that this objective function that I'm minimizing is exactly in the regularized risk minimization framework, right? So my regularizer, yeah, the, the trade-off parameter is lambda. My regularizer is one half norm W squared. So in other words, I'm saying the way I measure how complicated my model is, is by saying I want short vectors, right? So my, so you're measuring norm square. So you're penalizing by the norm square. And here you're just averaging this beast, which is called the hinge loss. I'll, I'll talk about the hinge loss in just, just a minute. Okay. And for those of you who are wondering, how is this all connected to what Dale was talking about? Turns out it's very, very closely related. So if you remember, uh, when Professor Schurman was talking about his, his uh, one, of, one of the themes that he talked about is that when you're doing binary classification, what you really want is you want some kind of a, binary classifier, okay? And you want that the classifier incurs zero loss if it predicts the label correctly, and it incurs a unit loss if it predicts the label incorrectly. And of course, this is a very hard and nasty loss function to work with. And so what you usually end up doing is you, you end up making a convex upper bound to this loss function. There are many different convex upper bounds, some of which he talked about. And it turns out that this particular one, the, this max of zero, one minus y w dot x i, is an upper bound which looks like that. Okay. They're all coming from very similar, they, they all end up here, right? So all these, all these different perspectives end up or converge here. But this is sort of the loss perspective, right? So I could have talked about this completely without giving you any geometry, which is, sort of what Dale did, right? So he did not give you any geometric motivations. He simply convinced you that this is a loss function that you really want. This is nasty, so you just do a convex upper bound, and here is a convex upper bound. 
clear? But I came from a very different perspective. I said, oh, here is some geometry, here is some data points, let us try to classify them. But we ended up at exactly the same point. Okay? So this is again something that happens fairly common uh, in, in machine learning, that if you, if you sort of wear the right glasses and look at problems, you will see the connections between them. Okay? Clear? Questions? Too early in the morning? <laughs> Need some coffee, give me my coffee. <laughs> okay. So now yeah. So what do we gain by changing it from this constrained optimization problem uh -huh. to this regularized problem? Uh-huh. So okay, that's a that's an extremely good question. So the question is, what do you, what are you gaining? I mean, yes, you did all this gymnastics at 8 30 in the morning and I'm not even barely awake yet. The advantage it turns out is that there are a number of algorithms, a couple of which we are going to talk about to, uh, in this lecture in the next one, which can be used for solving problems of this particular form. And that's what I'm, I'm leading towards. And then in the, fifth, in the third lecture, we'll talk about how you, you can actually go from here and, and then you can dualize the problem and then you can solve the problem in the dual. Okay, so sort of everything today we are talking about is sort of this is our central piece of what we are going to talk about. And, if, and these are all, again, different views of how you can solve the same equation by using, uh, attacking them with different optimization methods, OK? Other questions? Thanks for asking that question. <laughs> Good. So let's go. Now you say, OK, fine, I have a, I have a unconstrained optimization problem. How can I find its optimum? Right? So we talked a little bit about optimization in the first lecture, about convex functions. We did a little bit of warm-up exercises. And we looked at a few important properties of convex functions. Right? So now let us go back and recall. So what I'm going to do is I know that it's been a while. So some of these slides are repeated from the first lecture, just so that you keep them in mind. Okay? So if you remember, we saw this in the first lecture. A beautiful property of the convex functions is the fact that if you take a first order Taylor expansion about any point, okay, this first order Taylor expansion is always a lower bound, a global lower bound to this objective function. Okay, so this was a property we saw before. So now let us try to use this property to somehow come up with an optimization scheme that can work and try to find the minimum of an convex function, okay, of an unconstrained convex function. That's our goal. So what we are going to do is I'm going to assume the following things, okay. So somebody gives you a function, okay, it is coded up in some whatever language they have, okay, maybe a C function. They tell you that the function is convex, okay, so this is known to you. Additionally, I want to assume one more piece of information. They tell you that the function has a lower bound. Okay, so they tell you that the function never goes below 42 or whatever. In our case for machine learning problems, this lower bound is usually zero. You're, you can verify that the regularized risk never goes below zero. Okay, so that's usually known. Okay? So these are two things that are given to you. So you're given a black box function for which again you can evaluate gradients, okay? And you're given a lower bound, fairly benign conditions. Nothing has changed compared to what we did last time. The only thing now I'm assuming is there's some sort of a lower bound, okay? So clear? So now suppose somebody gives you this function, you can do the following thing. Since you know the lower bound, you can say, well, you know, I know that the function is somewhere in this gray region. Right? So somewhere in this, in this uh, gray uh, rectangle that I drew, the function sits somewhere in there. Clear? You can always write that. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to refine this bound. Okay? That's basically my idea. So what do I mean by refining this bound? I'm going to say I just take a point, some arbitrary point. Uh, uh, so actually, the, uh, you know, in fact, what you should have in mind is this function is actually extending way above. Right? I mean, it's just because I cannot plot it, I'm not plotting it. So I just take some, some arbitrary location, okay, in this case, this red point, and I find a Taylor expansion of this function at this point. Okay? 
Now you know from, from this slide that the Taylor expansion is always a lower bound. Okay, so since the, fun the Taylor exp oops, since the function, uh, the Taylor expansion is a lower bound, immediately you can make a statement that the function cannot lie in this region. Okay? So which means, yep. Sorry? So I'm assuming that the black box can compute the function and the derivative for you. Yeah. Sorry, I, I, I don't remember whether I mentioned it. Yeah. So the black box can, uh, so it's always our standing assumption that the black box can give you a function value and a, and a gradient at any point. Okay? So immediately, once you know this, piece by, uh, this Taylor expansion, you can say something more. You can say the function is definitely not going to lie in this region. So you know a little bit more about your function. Okay. So now comes the sort of tricky part, or sort of the, the, the leap of faith. Okay. So, so what, what these cutting plane methods assume is they say, for a minute, forget your function. Okay. So just, just assume that your function is not there. And just concentrate on this lower bound. Okay. So this is this lower bound that you get. What can you say about this lower bound? Immediately, you can say one thing that is fairly geometric, which is that it is all it is piecewise linear. What does it mean? It's basically every every part is linear, and then it's consisting of a set of piecewise linear pieces. Okay? Turns out that these functions, which are piecewise linear, are rather easy to optimize. I mean, you know, for for those of you who want to get into the technical details, it's basically nothing but you call an LP solver, and the LP solver gives you the the minimum of these pieces. Right? So again, Dale alluded to this a couple of times in his lectures, and there's a fairly standard fact that you can take any piecewise linear function, throw it into an LP solver, and more or less it will give you a minimum. Okay? And of course, since these are linear functions, any one of these points could have been a minimum, and let's just assume that my LP solver returns this green point as the minimum. Okay? Now what these methods do is they say, okay, now I know the minimum of my piecewise linear function. Let me go and evaluate a function gradient at this location. Okay? So I go and evaluate a function gradient at that location. Once I evaluate a function gradient at that location, now you see I can say more about my function. Right? So I know that my function definitely cannot lie above this line. I know that my function, sorry, below this line, and I know that my function cannot lie below this line. If I combine the two, I can say that my function will never lie below this piecewise linear piece. Clear? Now again, let me do the same thing. Go back, ask my LP solver, and let's say my LP solver gives me this as the, as the next point. Okay. I again cut a gradient here. And look what is happening. Okay, something really nice is happening. You are able to make a statement. You are sort of almost localizing the function. You sort of know more and more about the function. You know that, oh, now my function cannot lie about this region. Right? And I can go off and find the next minimum, which is at this point, right? cut a gradient, and you see, I'm getting a better and better idea of how the function looks like. Okay, so this is the fundamental idea behind a cutting plane method. You localize your function. You sort of try to find out more and more about how it looks like locally. Okay, but this still doesn't. I mean, you know, for those of you who are paying attention, say, okay, all this is fine. But what am I going to do with this beast? What do? What does it help me in any way to localize this function, right? Or sort of to know more and more about where the function lies? How can I turn it into an algorithm for optimization? Right? After all, I mean, you know, the, the, that's, our, that's our goal. We want to come up with an optimization algorithm. It turns out that as you cut more and more planes, right, you will end up with a better and better model of the objective function. And more importantly, you'll start getting closer and closer to the true minimum of this function. Okay? How can, I, how can I still justify this? How can I still figure out how far away I am from the optimum? Right? So this is a question that I'm sure it's, it's burning in your minds. And the answer to that is the following figure. Okay. So pay attention to this figure. First of all, let's look at this black point. Okay. The black point 
is the minimum of this piecewise linear set of functions, right? So this, this black, all these, all these black lines, all, all these planes that I cut, okay? This black point is the minimum of all these planes, okay? What can you say about this black point? Guesses? Sorry? Yes. So I know that this set of black lines is a piecewise linear lower bound to the function, right? So if I give you a function and I give and I give you another function which is always lower, then if you find the minimum of the of the second function which is lower, you know that that minima will always lie below the minima of the blue function. Clear? Because the the black functions are all piecewise linear and they are all lower bound to this function. On the other hand, what can you say about these red points? Sorry? Yes. Right? So the red points are always above the true minima. Why is that? Because they're all just, I'm just evaluating the function at some random points. Right? So every one of these red points is going to be somewhere at or above the, the true minima. Okay? So now what does this tell you? There is one, so if I take the minimum of these red points, which turns out to be this guy, okay? I know that this guy is above the true minimum. This guy is below the true minimum, which means this blue thing that I'm, uh, this cyan thing that I'm drawing here is the gap. Sort of tells me how far away am I from the optimum. And if I can make this gap small enough, sufficiently small to a certain tolerance, I am done. Okay? See, what is the beauty of this whole thing? What is the piece of information that I used? Just one piece of information, which is that a convex function is universally lower bounded by linear function. Okay? I did not use anything else at all. It's never going to be, uh, sorry, a support? It's going to be in the support of your function, right? Uh, support as in you mean the point where the function is non-zero or in the domain? Yeah, where it's well, like, like you have the red points uh -huh. that are indicating where the function is well, uh -huh. fine, but then the point that you're going to end up with, like the black point, uh -huh. Yeah, it's not part of the blue function ever, right? But I know that this is a quantity which is never, which is always below the true value of the function, right? So it's like, a, let us say if the true optimum is 50. I know that this quantity, this black dot, this, this height of this black dot will never be more than 50. So I'm not using the black dot itself. I'm just using how high it is in some sense, right? Okay. If a function is ill condi define ill conditioned. Uh, this is these, these methods are fairly um, immune to to ill conditioning. There, there is a, they, they will show up in the bounds. I'll show you in a minute the bounds. Uh, the, so basically, the bounds will depend somehow on the condition number, but it will just be a constant factor multiplier. Okay, it will not change the uh, the uh, epsilon convergence rates. We'll talk about them. Yeah. Okay, so that's an extremely good question. I will answer this in in just about a minute. Okay. So the the question was, why wouldn't you just why would you need to do this complicated scheme of trying to find out this gap? Why wouldn't you just look at the gradient and see if the gradient is going to zero? Then you know that you you know you have converged. Okay, uh, it's an extremely good question. I'll I'll come back to that. Okay. Other questions? Good. So you guys are alert and awake without coffee. Huh? <laughs> so okay. So let's 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 run through the equation uh, through the equations now and try to figure out what is what is happening. Okay, and then we will we'll come back to exactly the question it was asked. Okay. So 
what we are doing here is that so you can you can in a nutshell you can summarize cutting plane methods as follows you form what is called a cutting plane model of your function okay which is just you take all your piecewise linear pieces and you take a you know a max over them and so this is your cutting plane model you know that your true function lies strictly uh, i mean is is always above your cutting plane model okay and then at every iteration basically you go and minimize your cutting plane model find the next iterate and at that iterate you find the gradient and you enhance your model right so clear and you stop when your duality gap so the i call this the duality gap but this is not strictly uh, the what is uh, i mean there are different notions of duality gap so you know if you if if, if you are really pedantic about it i should just call it the gap um, so this this so called duality gap when this duality gap goes below a certain threshold then i stop okay so this is the these are the minimum of the red points that is the black point sorry uh, the color coding is wrong this must be black so this is the black point this is the minimum of those uh, red points and when this gap is falls below a certain threshold you're done clear any questions about the method itself okay yeah, very very simple very geometric right so, uh -huh. sorry just the off by one ordering thing so if you go back to the picture uh -huh. it's always going to be between that red point there and a black uh -huh. Yes, yes, yes. So yeah. Kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, it's just you have to. Yeah, this is actually that's a good point. I mean, you see, you have to be very careful with these indices i and j, uh, you know, because you don't want to mess things up. Uh, but yeah, you, you you have to pay attention to that. Okay. But again, like I said, pay more attention to the sort of the intuition rather than the exact. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's good that you're parsing it, but you know, if you're some of you are not parsing it that early in the morning, it's okay. Okay, you're still fine. Now, if you actually think about this kind of a of a of a scheme, where is it really really useful? Where does it really shine? Where it really shines is when you're trying to work with a non-smooth function. So let me let me talk about this uh, a little bit, and then sort of the the answer to the question would also become clear. Okay. So here is again our uh, favorite example. There is a you know some some function. The function is uh, is not convex. Uh, sorry, is uh, is not differentiable. But it turns out, remember, that even though the convex function is not differentiable. there exists this notion of a subgradient right so what is the notion of a subgradient the notion of a subgradient is that there is a line you can always draw a line a tangent line to the function such that the function lies entirely above the tangent line okay and the, uh, the only problem of course was that at a non differentiable point you might find more than one tangent lines okay so remember this notion of subgradients so some of you said came up to me the other day and said oh they don't quite fully understand the notion of subgradients or they don't have a feel for what the subgradients do for for those of you again just to re remind you is basically nothing but a subgradient is nothing but a tangent line it it is basically a linear expansion of the function at that point such that the linear expansion always lies below the function okay and the remarkable property is that you can always find one okay we'll again come back we'll talk a lot about these uh, these subgradients more and more today but the basic intuition is the following No, it's just it was easy to plot. <laughs> I was just lazy enough to not do anything else. Yeah. Um, other questions? Okay. So now the good news is the following: if you again ponder about it for a minute, there is nothing in the cutting plane method which says that the function should be differentiable. Clear? because the only the one and only property that we used of the convex functions was the fact that there was a piecewise linear lower bound available so the good thing is that you can happily chug along feed this black box this cutting plane method and non smooth function and ask it to do exactly what it is doing which is you know you can just uh, do a piecewise linear lower bound at every iteration and you can happily work with subgradients Oops, what did I do? 
Okay. Yeah, you can happily work with subgradients. And all you need to do is at any point choose an arbitrary subgradient and you're done. Okay. So now coming back to, to the question of why don't you just do use the norm of the gradient, if you just use the norm of the gradient, you couldn't do this. Right? Because uh, if you remember the V-shape example that I drew before, if you choose an arbitrary subgradient, the arbitrary subgradient could be as far away as you want from zero, right? And you'd never detect convergence. But with this scheme, you can still detect convergence. Okay? Clear? So, yep. Yes. So all you need to do is, if you land at a non-differentiable point, give me an arbitrary sub subgradient and I can happily work. Because you remember the property of the subgradients is any arbitrary subgradient at this non-differentiable point, it still gives you this piecewise linear lower bound. But what is my Yeah, sure, sure, sure. I'm not, I'm not making any claims about how fast you would converge. The method would still converge, okay? So now the good, and again, this is good. You guys are jumping two steps ahead of me. Uh, so I know that if there is good news, there must be bad news too, right? <laughs> this is always life, this yin and yang. So if there, is if there is good news, then what is the bad news? Well, you know, why are we all not, I mean, why are we all not finished and we could have gone home and be done with it? The bad news turns out to be a coffee cup. <laughs> okay, so basically it's a function which looks like a coffee cup you know, the one that you'd get from, I don't know, Starbucks or someplace. If you want to optimize a function like this using a cutting plane method, okay, and this is a very nice uh, sort of uh, exercise in visualization, which I will let you think about for a while uh, to, to rev up your minds, is that this kind of a function, you can show that if you start with a cutting plane method at any one of these corner points, um, and you have an adversarial oracle which gives you a bad subgradient at every location. So you have to do it with an adversary argument. So uh, if you have an adversarial oracle, basically you can spend exponentially large number of steps trying to, uh, trying to figure out what is the shape of this function around this point before you find your last subgradient, which is the flat one. And then you would realize that you, you should stop. Okay? But before you get there, you would spend exponentially large amount of time. Basically, think, I mean, you know, it's not that hard to think about it because it's very geometric. All you need is an oracle which will always give you a subgradient which has exactly this norm, uh, which is exactly on this circle. And then you can, you, you know, it's, it's a nice exercise. Think about it. I can give you the, I think the form of the function is something like max of zero and the norm of x plus two times an epsilon, which is the cutting value cut minus one. So it's a, either I can give you the analytic form of this function and you can sort of do this at home. Okay? So this is a do at home exercise, strongly encouraged, try it. Okay? But there's a diagram for It's not clear, right? Because I, what did I tell you? I, all I know is it's a black box function, okay? And all I can do is evaluate the gradient and the function. Right? So I do not know, and, and again, <laughs> think of it. I mean, these, these are examples that I draw for visualization. So they are 2D or 3D, but a real optimization problem would be in a few hundreds or thousands of dimensions, right? So it's not very easy. The bottom, bottom part, we won't see any uh, decrease in the uh, gap, right? You cannot always assume that when you're not decreasing your gap, that doesn't mean you're not converging. So. Uh, you know, that's, that's a problem. Okay? Yeah? Is there any sense for how often these types of functions actually occur? Yeah. Very often, very often. You, you wouldn't, you'd be very surprised, uh, I mean, in the, in, when you go to higher dimensions, these kind of functions, I mean, these kind of nasty things, everything nasty that you can think about will happen when you work with non-smooth functions in high dimensions. Okay? <laughs> it's just, that's a law. Uh, with non-strict minimizer? No, this is not just restricted to functions with non-strict minimizer. You can also construct other functions which could have. Also, like, I think you can tell the minimizer by the, 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 the number is equal to infinity, right? Uh, 
Uh, no, this, the condition number does not play such a big role. I mean, again, the condition number gives you a constant in the bounds. Uh, we will we'll talk about the bounds. When I talk about the bounds, you will see that the condition number gives you a constant in the bounds. The, the constant may be large, but this is not. So, so you have to understand, when I say that on, the, on a function like this, it is taking exponentially large number of steps, it is exponential in the epsilon parameter, the, the tolerance that you are giving me, not in the condition number, right? So the condition number is a constant, the constant can be arbitrarily bad, but it's like order of exponential in the epsilon, not in the, the you know, I just treat the other ones in the order notation. Other questions? So how do you fix this problem? I mean, you know, these cutting plane methods were invented about 50 years ago. So it's still remarkable. I mean, 50 years ago, people were thinking about problems that we are still grappling with today. Okay. So this is a this is an algorithm due to Kelly, and uh, for a long time, people believed that the the, the issue was solved. But uh, I think this is an this counterexample is due to Nemirovsky uh, in his 1977 book, which which is almost unparsable. <laughs> But if you spend six months of your time, you could write like 10 dissertations in machine learning out of it. If you learned how to parse it, it helps especially if you're Russian. <laughs> so, so people have then started, so there, there's a large group of people then who started looking at how can I fix this? Okay, so starting with people like Kivial, uh, Lemarchal, um, there, there, there are a bunch of people who started thinking about how can I fix this issue? Right? So how, how can I do things slightly better than the cutting plane method? So can I somehow do non-smooth optimization with convex functions without paying this exponential cost somehow? Okay? And the idea they came up with is very is again you know um, is is quite similar to what you do in machine learning, right? So you remember what Dale told you? Whenever you do a machine learning problem, you will overfit. So if you overfit, what do you need to do? You just regularize, right? So they said, oh, let's do the same thing, right? <laughs> then, so they came from the same viewpoint and they said, oh, you know what, let's add a regularizer. So if you, I mean, again, if you think about it for a minute, the reason these bad cases happen is because an oracle can completely mislead you and sort of makes you, I mean, I call it jumping off the cliff. So an oracle makes you jump off the cliff. But what you can do is you can sort of assume that you use your cutting plane model, but then you somehow penalize it a little bit. Right? So you penalize it a little bit by saying, I, I don't want to go too far away from my previous parameter. Right? So even if the oracle gives me a very bad subgradient, I don't fully trust that guy. I'm going to I'm going to stick to where I was before, right? And then there is this parameter which trades off between the two. Again, a similar I mean, an equivalent form of regularization is just to take this and I put it into the constraints. And this is a third form which is a weird set. I think this is more due to Nestroff, where they instead of, they they minimize the regularizer but ensure that the cutting plane the the value of the cutting plane model is below a certain parameter. Okay, so this is all classic ways of fixing uh, these uh, cutting plane methods. And for some strange reason, they are called bundle methods. So uh, the only reason I can think about why they're called bundle methods is you sort of keep a bundle of the previous subgradients around. And so that's probably why they call them bundle <laughs> methods. So, yep. Because when you're coming up with this cutting plane method, you need all the past subgradients. You remember this is the this is the cutting plane method, right? So this is all you need to keep all your past subgradients around. Right? Otherwise, how do you? I mean, if you did not have them, you do not you do, you do not know your piecewise linear bound. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Uh, let, let's yeah. Uh -huh. The, co the coffee cup? Uh -huh. How does that regularization help in this case? Uh, it ensures that there is a unique, so when, when you are doing and when you are um, taking this step, see this uh, step, right? When you do this, because you are solving an LP, roughly what happens is there are a number of, number of local optima that are possible and an oracle can choose a bad local optima and that is why it is making you do uh, exponentially many steps, 
but if you add a, a, a quadratic function to this, then this becomes uh, what is called a strongly convex function. You remember we talked about strongly convex functions. Strongly convex functions have a unique global minima. So in some sense the oracle does not have power anymore. It has to give you that, that point. So there is no choice left in the oracle. Question? Sorry? So I am assuming that you have a black box function but somebody tells you that the function is convex. So you remember that was the very first two assumptions that I made that somebody you have a black box function you know that the function so you can evaluate the function and the gradient and you know that the function is convex and there is a lower bound. Con, sorry? Oh, yeah, yeah. So you should always use a bundle method. You should. Yeah, yeah. So I explained the cutting plane methods, but in practice, you, I mean, you know, because without understanding cutting plane methods, you would never understand bundle methods. But yeah, if you, if you are doing things in practice, you should always use a bundle method. So the cutting plane methods I don't think anybody uses anymore really um, in, in practice because of that, of that case. And like I told you when you go to higher dimensions you do see that exponential behavior in many, many cases. Okay. Other questions? Okay. So one of the bad things about all these different bundle methods that people have invented is that there is this parameters, this trade off parameters. So, you know, it's basically the same thing as similar to the lambda, lambda parameter that we have. This trade off parameter needs to be tuned very, very carefully. If you want to get good conversions, uh, you know, and good practical performance, you need to tune these parameters. And this is kind of a pain most of the time. Sir, you said that you, uh, you keep track of all the previous Uh, so you keep all the so at every location where you where you queried see every every location where you queried you keep a subgradient uh, the practical implementation of course would not keep all the past subgradients but it would have a buffer say of the last some certain number and then at some point you you discard things from the buffer that's a practical implementation yep uh-huh Yes, 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 yes. And that's actually one of the big issues. So uh, you, cannot just, you cannot just directly go and set this to some constant and say, okay, I'm done with it. Because again, think of it. When you're far away from the optimum, right? So you, don't wa you want this guy to sort of help you not take too large steps. But when you're closer and closer to the optimum, you want this term to basically decay to zero. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, more or less, more or less. So there are some very clever schemes. There are some very clever schemes for how you can tune this, uh, but you know, uh, it's it's not doesn't quite work. Uh, these ones, these two, the trust region and the level set are a little bit better. I mean, in trust region, you could potentially set this kappa to. Uh, uh, this is my understanding that you could potentially set the kappa to a constant, and it would still work because the sort of the trust region simply tells you don't move too far away. This is the only region where I trust my model. But uh, definitely for the proximal uh, bundle method, uh, you know, the, the, the psi has to be tuned very carefully. And that's one of the pain points. I mean, if you want to really apply bundle methods, you get this kind of pain. Okay? Not just that, there is another thing that happens. If you look at a subgradient, you know, because of the, the way this entire cutting plane method works, it is not always true that you will find a, a point which will decrease your objective function. Right? So you remember, there, you know, we are just evaluating the piecewise linear lower bound, then we go off and find out the value of the function and keep go, doing this. Sort of we are ignoring the function for those 
for those iterations, right? So it turns out that you may not always decrease the objective function. In some cases, you would just you just be stuck because you cannot decrease the the value of the objective function. So what these all these methods would have is they have what is called two stage process. So the first stage would be what they call a null step, which is you sort of say what is happening? I have a non-smooth function. Because I have a non-smooth function, I do not know enough about what is happening around me. Right? So I am at a, you know, a three-dimensional function. I don't know what is happening around me. So what I need to do in that case is I need to explore locally around this point to see how the function looks like. Once I have a good idea of how the function looks like locally, then I can say, oh, now I have enough confidence to go and take a step, and that step will decrease my objective function. So this is this kind of steps where you explore the function locally is called a null step, and the place where you actually decrease your objective function is called a serious step. Okay? The problem with, again, these methods is that both of them, both the null step and the serious step, require you to evaluate your objective function many times over and the gradient many times over. This is usually very problematic in machine learning. Right? You don't want to do this. Uh, you, you know, every objective function and gradient evaluation means you have to run through your data entirely once. Okay? And if you have a billion points, which means you have to run through your billion points once to compute your function and gradient because of the form of our objective function. Okay? So what we want to do, therefore, is to try and avoid as many function and gradient evaluations as possible. And at the same time, we want to sort of use the fact that we know what is the objective function that we are optimizing. Okay? So part two of the story will be after the break when I'll show you that you can actually use the, uh, the, function, oops, the function and gradient evaluations. Uh, you can use the fact that you're doing something clever. You can do something clever by knowing that you're doing regularized risk minimization. So if, if somebody told you that it's not just a black box, but it's a regularized risk that you're minimizing, then I can do something slightly smarter. Okay? So I'll show you that. Let's take a uh, two or three minute break or, you know, and come back at 8.35, since I'm running much slower than I thought I would. But uh, let's take a three minute break.